Good evening, I'm Lawrence Hill. In the 17th century, French and British doctors competed madly to see who could carry out the first successful blood transfusion. So, in 1667, a doctor named Jean-Baptiste Denis spotted an obviously agitated man named Antoine Marois on the streets of Paris, abducted him, forced him into a room, and transfused the blood of a calf into the patient's veins. The physician believed that the tranquil spirit of the calf would enter the patient's bloodstream, calm his mind, and rid him of his problems. Well, it rid the patients of his problems, all right. <laughs> it, rid, it rid him of every single problem because it killed him. This evening, I'll borrow from my Massey lectures to show some thoughts on how we rely on blood to define humanity. No other bodily tissue competes with blood when it comes to providing us with metaphors for seeing ourselves and understanding life. For some 2,000 years, philosophers imagined blood as one of the fundamental characteristics of our body and soul. We came to believe that sickness arose as a result of an imbalance between the body's four humors, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. The ancients believed that too much blood could endanger your health, which led to bloodletting, a practice that lasted for thousands of years. Countless people died of bloodletting. Napoleon survived the bloodletting and went on to describe medicine as the science of murderers. <laughs> Mozart is thought to have died of shock from bloodletting. George Washington lost his life a day after more than two liters of blood were taken from him to help him get over a cold. Typically, men have viewed blood as a byproduct of accident, sport, or war. For men, bloodshed implies duty to steam, to team, army, or nation. When a woman bleeds during her monthly cycle, it's a symbol of fertility. But we also have vilified women for shedding their blood. Men in ancient Greece seemed to be fuddled by women's blood. How could women bleed so often and still not die? <laughs> Philosophers concluded that menstrual bleeding was proof of women's inferiority. Aristotle wrote that men had sufficient heat in their bodies to transform some of their blood into semen. But women, he said, were colder and lacked the necessary heat to produce semen. Therefore, they ended up with too much blood and had to expel it monthly. Fear of blood has led us to carry out heinous insults to humanity. The Catholic monarchs of medieval Spain may have been the first to equate blood and race and to incite hatred of people with impure blood. Even people of Jewish and Islamic origin whose families had converted to Christianity were deemed to have, have, were deemed to have impure blood and burned at the stake or expelled during the Spanish Inquisition. Since that time, perpetrators of genocide have often cited blood impurity to justify murder. But blood has also been used to define and quantify racial identity. In Canada and the States, for example, traditionally, if you had any known blood, a single drop of so-called black blood in your family line, then you were determined to be black for the purposes of slavery and segregation. As for quantifying or describing the blood of mixed race peoples, there are more terms than could fill a book. Mulatto, quadroon, and octoroon are just the most common ones. The Dictionary of Latin American Racial and Ethnic Terminology contains 7,000 terms. One of them is calpa mulatto, which purports to describe a person whose blood is, and I quote, 25% white, 50% Indian, and 25% black. Ludicrous equations of blood and race affect not just private thought, but public policy. When the United States was preparing to enter World War II, it passed a law forbidding black people from donating their blood to white recipients. The rule infuriated African Americans who protested against this denial of their right to exercise their philanthropy. Doctors knew that racial identity had nothing to do with safe blood transfusion. All that mattered was matching blood types between donor and recipient. But it didn't matter. When it came to giving blood on a massive scale, racial politics trumped science. The prejudice continues today. After tainted blood scandals rocked Canada and the world, 
in the 1980s, killing and injuring thousands of hemophiliacs and others who'd been led to believe that they were receiving safe blood transfusions. Gay men were barred from donating blood. This was an understandable step at the time as scientists hadn't come to understand HIV. The science of transfusion has grown by light years in the intervening decades, but blood donation policies have not kept pace. We still exclude gay donors who are sexually active. Even the American Medical Association says that the blanket ban on gay donors should be revoked. Eventually, we'll get to a more effective policy that reflects the fullness of our knowledge. Blood also unites us. After 9-11 and the Boston Marathon bombings, so many people rushed to donate blood that hospitals had to turn them away. We give our blood without payment or recognition. For the most part, no donor knows who will receive their blood. No recipient knows who to thank. We give because it makes us human. One night, while preparing to go to bed, my stepdaughter, Beatrice Friedman, about six years old at the time, was discussing her identity with her mom, my wife, Miranda. The conversation first touched on whether Beatrice was Jewish, given that her father is. This is a tricky issue, because Jewish ancestry is traditionally determined by matrilineal descent. Miranda reiterated that Beatrice was related through her family to Jewish people. After pondering this for a moment, Beatrice, who'd been in my life for about three years at this point, said, and I'm a little bit black too, right? <laughs> Miranda asked what Beatrice meant to say. Beatrice replied, well, Larry's black and I'm his stepdaughter, so that makes me a little bit black too. No, that's not how it works, Miranda replied. She went on to say that black identity is seen to derive from your biological parents, in other words, along lines of family blood. I find it touching to think of Beatrice identifying with people she loved, her father, me, but running into social barriers every step of the way. Who's to say that Beatrice could not be black or Jewish if she wanted? Who can argue that others have not done so previously? Is your identity an absolute function of family blood? Can you not create an identity for yourself? Given that identity arises from social functions, who is to say that your identity cannot change temporarily or permanently? What if you'd always been led to believe that you were white and discovered in your 40s that your father was black and had passed, it, and had passed for white and had hidden it from you all those years? All those relatives you never met. Are you suddenly one of them by dint of this new discovery? Who's to say what is in our blood and who is in charge of a person's identity? Ultimately, each one of us must be free to invoke the metaphors of our own blood, assert our own identity, and accept the humanity of every one of our neighbors on this planet. Thank you.